Gospel chapter 15. As we look for a few moments today into the humiliation of Jesus Christ. The humiliation of Christ. Mark 15, verses 16 to 20. I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you would. As, as I read this, you follow along in your Bibles. I hope you have your Bible with you. If you don't, for some reason, we're going to put the text on the screen for you. But I really want you to have your own copy of the Scripture. And we'll do what we can to make that happen if you let me know. Verse 16. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him. And kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they let him out. My battery just died. The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. Let's, let's hear it for that today. Let's let it grip us. Be seated. You know, there's, uh, in, the, in the Gospels, there's the Matthew story of the Incarnation. Uh, there's the, uh, the Luke story of the Incarnation. We've told you as we're studying through Mark that Mark, Mark did not deal with the Incarnation. He's, he's moving as quickly as he can to the cross to tell us why Jesus came. John's Gospel, John has his own twist on the Incarnation, but it's really more about the eternality of Jesus. But then Paul, as I mentioned earlier, Paul adds his own reflection upon the Incarnation in Philippians 2. He tells us what it was. Not so much, not so much the circumstances and the, and the surrounding Jesus' birth, but the nature of his birth. The eternal Son of God humbles himself. And he challenges us in that. Because he begins the narrative by saying, this mind that we found in Christ, this mindset, should be your mindset. This humble king should model for us humility. And as we think today about this vile and vicious way that our Savior was treated by sinners as he faced the awesome specter of Calvary, we need to see that he was intensely and intentionally humiliated by them. You can read that narrative and it's enough to make grown men weep if, if those grown men love him. And no doubt if we had observed that, if we had stood and watched all of this going on, it would have reduced us to tears. But make no mistake, brothers and sisters, the eternal Son of God is so glorious in his splendor that if he had come to earth and been greeted by all the religious leaders and all the political authorities with outstretched arms and placed in a cradle made of pure gold, it still would have been a totally humbling and humiliating experience for him because of who he is and where he came from. As we've celebrated the Lord's Supper together, which captures with powerful symbols his, his death for us and his shed blood and broken body for us, we need to consider what that means for us and what it should mean to us and how we should respond to it. I want to read just briefly. It's a passage from the pen of, of J.C. Ryle, who lived in the 1800s. 
referencing a, a portion of what we just read. He said, this passage we've now read is one of those which show us the infinite love of Christ towards sinners. The sufferings described in it would fill our minds with mingled horror and compassion if they had been inflicted on one who was only a man like ourselves. But when we reflect that the sufferer was the eternal Son of God, we're lost in wonder and amazement. And when we reflect further that these sufferings were voluntarily endured to deliver sinful men and women like ourselves from hell, we may see something of St. Paul's meaning when he says, the love of Christ passes knowledge. When he says again in Romans, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Raoul goes on to say, we shall find it useful to examine this passage of the Lord's passion. Following him step by step, from the moment of his condemnation by Pilate, to his last hour upon the cross. Because there's deep meaning, Raoul says, in every jot and tittle of his sorrows. All striking emblems of spiritual truth. And we should never forget that we need to dwell upon the wondrous story. The old, old story we call it of Jesus and his love. That we, that we in our sins were the cause of all these sufferings. Christ suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, Peter said. When we look at this passage and the following verses leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus, we are studying the death of one who was our own surety, our own substitute. So I want us to see for just a few minutes this morning, look at this, this brief passage from these different considerations and angles. First, Jesus is led away by those who should be following him. Irony there. Second, Jesus is mockingly clothed by those who need to be clothed in his righteousness. Third, Jesus is acknowledged, I have quotes around that, to be the king of the Jews by those who should have acknowledged their need of him sincerely. And then fourth, the farce of honoring Jesus is going to be replaced by the ferocious determination to crucify him. Let's just see these verses. First of all, he's led away by those who should be following him. Isn't it interesting? For three plus years, he had been this peripatetic preacher. He, that's, that's a fancy word. He walked. He, he taught as he walked. He would walk and talk. And point out, consider the lilies of the field. Look at the birds. And just teaching his disciples as they were hanging on what he was telling them. Wherever he went, they followed. And that was his command to others, if you want to be my disciple, follow me. Follow me. And yet here he is in his passion. The soldiers led him away inside the palace, that the governor's headquarters. And then they called together their cohorts, their, their fellow military personnel to do with him as they pleased. Jesus, in this scene, is delivered into the hands of the Roman soldiers just as a criminal condemned to death, as if he is a heinous character. He who before whom one day the whole world will stand to be judged allowed himself to be mistreated and judged harshly, handed over to wicked men, Why? Because it was the path God had ordained for him to deliver us from the pit of destruction, the torment of the prison of hell. Paul said it in Philippians. He did not consider his deity, his co-equality with the Father and the Spirit, his co-eternality, where he had lived for all of eternity. He did not consider those something, the maintenance of which he should be jealous about and cling to nature. To. That's the picture there in Philippians 2, to cling to it. Rather, he willingly released, turned loose with open hands. He willingly gave up that privilege, that precious 
blessed reality of face-to-face -face communion with the Father and the continual adoration of the angels. He gave it up. It's the passage in Philippians 2 is called the kenosis because of a word that's used in there. He emptied himself. It doesn't mean that he ceased being God. He did not empty himself of deity. But he emptied himself of the divine prerogative to appeal to that as a way to refresh himself or to protect himself. He emptied himself of all of those powers that he continued to have. He could have looked at this group of soldiers and with a look slain every one of them. Rather, in his incarnation, he used that look to bring people from the dead. A young man in a funeral procession, his mother weeping, Jesus brought him back, gave him back to his mom. Jairus' daughter, Talitha, brought her back. Lazarus brought him back. He could, have, he could have slain every one of those who dared to lay a hand on him. But he emptied himself of the prerogative to protect himself. And he offered himself. Second thing we see is that Jesus is mockingly clothed by those who need to be clothed in his righteousness. The New Testament would speak of putting on Christ. The armor of the Lord in Ephesians 6, the, the breastplate of righteousness. You see, we all come, according to Isaiah's prophecy, our righteousness, our idea of goodness, our, our notion that we do somehow do good works that make us appealing to God or that, or that qualify us, the prophet Isaiah said, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. George Whitfield, the great, one of the great preachers during the, uh, the awakening, first great awakening, said, when we come to repent, we need to repent, he said, of our, of our sinful nature. He said, secondly, we need to repent of our sins, of the practice of sin. In other words, a person who, who's repenting of sin but doesn't, is not aware that he or she is actually sinning, that's not real repentance, that's mouthy repentance. Repent of our sin nature, repent of our actual sins. But Whitfield also said this, and we need to repent of any notion of our own righteousness. We repent of our righteousnesses because they're filthy rags. Those robed in the regalia of the Roman centurion mock Jesus says they clothed him with a purple cloak. In other words, a, a symbol of royalty. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they pressed it on his head, mocking him as a king. He's made a laughing stock by the soldiers. And they themselves needed what he had. They should have looked to him. And folks, today we need to realize that there are people all around us that we have, we have lost in our culture any meaningful measure of good and bad. Here's what's just one example. A young man attempts this past week to kill people on a college campus by running over them in his car and getting out of the car with a butcher knife to inflict lethal harm on them. He failed in his attempt, but immediately the authorities and the media rush and say, you cannot make a connection between this young man's religion and what he was doing here today. In the same week, a husband and wife who have a successful uh, show on the HGTV channel of called Fixer Upper. People who go down into Texas make pilgrimage to Waco <laughs> to see where Chip and Joanna Gaines live and all the th that's proliferated under their, under their care and their expertise. Just this week it's come out in the news that the church that they attend 
that their pastor actually believes that marriage should be for one man and one woman only, exclusively, and that he believes abortion is murder and a sin. And therefore, these two people, remember now, this other young man, don't, don't make a connection with his religion and what he's doing, what he did. These two people are now considered bigots because they attend a church like this. Brothers and sisters, we have lost in this culture any meaningful measure of what is good and evil. Not, not us personally, but the cultural norm has been gone, removed. And so they think, these Romans think that they're mocking him is a good thing. But I've told you before, as we've been studying these passages, they are unwittingly playing into the hands of divine prophecy. The purple cloak, a symbol of royalty. The crown of thorns, albeit painful, is a crown nonetheless acknowledging him in some way, shape, or fashion at some level. So the third thing we want to see is that Jesus is acknowledged to be a king of the Jews. Now I told you earlier, Pilate's movement on this matter when he was talking to him earlier. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, that's what you said. What shall I do, he says to the people, to the king of the Jews? And then he says, would you have me crucify your king? No more believing what he's saying than a, than a children's fiction writer. But yet speaking prophetically about Jesus. And so watch what the soldiers do in verse 18. They began to salute him. Now they've got him clothed in a robe of purple, royal purple. They've got a crown on him and no doubt pressing it upon him. And when they're striking him, it's, it's burying the, the thorns into the, to the skull, into the... And they cry, Hail, King of the Jews. Their mockery condemns them because they should have sincerely knelt before him confessing him, Jesus Christ the Lord. Because again, the passage in Philippians teaches us that the day is coming when every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So I've said this through the years to you. You've heard others say it. It's really not a question. There's not anyone you know that you can say, well, I wonder if he or she will ever bow the knee to Jesus Christ and confess him as Lord. Philippians makes it plain, everyone will bow the knee. The question is when? For our children and our grandchildren and our loved ones and our friends and our neighbors, we know they're going to bow the knee. But our heart's desire and prayer to God is that they would bow the knee now and confess him as Lord now to their eternal salvation rather than wait until the end of the age when we're all summoned before the judgment seat of Christ and every knee will bow and confess him then to their condemnation. These soldiers mock him. While they're calling him king of the Jews, they're striking him with their, with their reeds, with their, their staffs. They're spitting on him. Then they kneel down to mock him, pretending homage. It's a horrible sight. Yet everything they're doing, simply pointing to the fulfillment of God's design for Jesus and his desire for you and me. And we see in the fourth place in this passage this farce. The farce of honoring Jesus is replaced by the ferocious determination to crucify him in verse 20. When they had mocked him, so when they, had, when they felt like that they had done enough, believe me, there was no concern for him. It was strictly for them. When they felt like that the, that the game had gone as far as, as they desired to take it at, at that point, they stripped him of the purple cloak, 
and put his own clothes back on him. And they led him out, took him out to crucify him, to execute him. Him they acknowledged as king of the Jews, mockingly albeit. Him they had clothed, fine purple robe. You see, one day Jesus will wear a robe. The book of Revelation tells us it is a robe of brilliant white, a shining white, a Shekinah white. He will wear it. It's a robe dipped in blood, we're told. Commentators differ. We told you this when we studied through Revelation together. Commentators differ on whether that is the blood of his enemies or the blood of of the martyrs. I, I believe that since he is coming from heaven where the martyrs cry out under the throne day and night, how long, O oh Lord, faithful and true, before you vindicate this, I think his robe is dipped in the blood of the martyrs. But we also know that when he returns, he will trample underfoot as a, as a grape grower, a vine dresser does when he has dumped all the grapes into a big vat. He takes off his sandals and he steps into it and begins to go around and around and around, trampling underfoot the grapes as, they are, as the juice is squeezed out of them and it runs out of that vat into containers waiting to catch the juice. That Jesus will do that. Get the picture now, the symbolism of his robe. Dipped in the blood of the martyrs, yes ultimately saturated with the blood of his enemies. The bloody mess, Jesus of Nazareth. Reviled by the Jewish Sanhedrin. Brutalized by the Romans. We'll get holy vengeance on his enemies. And the appeal today is, where are you in this? Are you still an enemy of the cross? You say, well, Pastor, I don't I don't rail against Jesus, but see that's not it doesn't that's not what it takes to be an enemy. All it takes to be an enemy of the cross is to not declare that you are a follower of the Lamb. That's you see, brothers and sisters we come by nature into this world, dead in trespasses and sins, and therefore enemies of the cross. And the cross to which Jesus is going will either in the end judge us or be the means by which we are found not guilty. And the, and the difference is, how do we stand in relation to the cross? Have we bowed the knee to Jesus Christ while we live? Is our life a life lived in submission to Him? A bowed head, a bowed heart. Head, heart, and hands committed to following Him. The passage of Scripture Norman referenced for the title of Jesus earlier today. In that passage in John 10, Jesus says, My sheep, hear my voice and I know them and they, my sheep, follow me. Is that what marks our lives? Because see, if it's not, we're in the position of being an enemy of the cross. He goes, we're going to be studying this passage, he goes willingly to die for all Sinners who express a repenting faith. But he only dies for sinners who express a repenting faith. Have you repented of your sins? Confessed faith in Christ? Is, that, is your life marked by that? A life daily repenting for sin. Daily confessing faith in Christ as an outworking 
of the fruit of the reality of the new birth in your life. It's my prayer that that, that is true. And of those here for whom it is not, my prayer is that you would soon come to Christ, that somewhere along the line this season, as you hear the great hymns of the coming of a Savior, as you, as you contemplate gazing upon Bethlehem's baby, that you'll be gripped. That he was, as one of the great carols says, born to die that I might live. Born to die, that I might live. Behold the humiliated Son of God. But he was willing to be humiliated so that all who put their trust and faith in him would be delivered from a fate much worse than what he was about to experience. If you know Jesus Christ here today, then live for him boldly. Declare him in this season where people get excited for all the wrong reasons. If you don't know him yet, oh, you, you will get no greater gift this Christmas season than the gift of the grace of God shown to you in Jesus Christ. My prayer is that you will receive it. Let's pray together. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we bow before you in Jesus' name. And, oh, Lord, it grips us to see the torture, to read about the torture that our Savior experienced, and to know that he did not do that because he deserved it, but he did it because we deserved it. I'm so grateful for your grace shown to us in the gospel. The good news that Jesus lived and died and rose again and offers himself freely to all who will confess him as Lord. Because, Lord, we know everyone in this room will either now or at the judgment confess him as Lord. My prayer is that everyone in this room either has or will confess him as Lord now to your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.